Good morning. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who were here yesterday, you, you got a chance to see a little bit about what my own operation and some of us in the States are, are doing. And um, I've been, between Australia and New Zealand, I've been traveling for the last month, and it's been wonderful to, to meet with beekeepers and to kind of get a feel for what's going on here. And, and although it's different than what we do in the States, I can see some things that are, that are similar. Uh, here in, in uh, New Zealand, this uh, situation with Manuka is really taxing your natural resources and you're trying to rear bees for a short period of time. And to make honey, everybody knows you need a lot of bees in the hive. So um, the whole idea of, of how we do that and how we control the bees, um, some people find it difficult to understand uh, the concept of feeding bees, feeding bees syrup or feeding bees protein because they, they have it in their mind that that the bees should be collecting their own food. And in a natural system, that works fine. But um, the question is, what are we asking our bees to do for us? In the, in the case of the, the US, we're asking them to, to be big hives in the middle of the winter to pollinate almonds. And we have customers that are expecting us to have these, these large hives. Uh, beekeepers are problem solvers. That's kind of comes with the, the territory. And so when given a challenge to have big hives at, a, at the wrong time of year, we figure out ways to do this. Um, is that the best thing for our bees? That's a, I can't address that topic in 30 minutes. Uh, I'm going to try to stay within time here. But I'm going to show you some of the things that we did, uh, or um, people continue to do, to, to help to feed bees to to bring them up to the conditions. Um, the other thing that, that happened for us is uh, for roughly uh, almond pollination is four or five weeks a year. The rest of the year, those bees need to eat. And uh, it would, our bees are managed. They're, they're really not wild. And if you had any kind of other animal uh, that you put in a, in a paddock with a fence, if you had cows or sheep or horses and you, you saw that they didn't have enough food and you didn't feed them, there would be something criminal about that. People don't think of bees the same way. Um, they, they need to survive the whole year. So uh, big picture, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, artificial feeding, but uh, at the end of my talk, if I have a few minutes, I want to talk about what I think is the ultimate future, that this is actually a transition phase artificial feeding. Uh, the long-term goals are to have enough forage for bees so they can get food the way they're supposed to be from, from uh, plants. So the basics, what do bees need? Uh, everybody knows that bees need honey, bees need pollen. Well, the, you should know that. Uh, too often we found that, particularly uh, beginning beekeepers, they'll open their hive and they say there's plenty of honey in there, and they'll close it up and they'll say everything's fine. When you're in your hives, you should be looking at pollen stores. You should be looking at what's coming in the front door, if, if there's uh, pollen on the bees' legs, that's important, but you should be looking there. Bees will continue to rear brood even on poor pollen uh, or, or insufficient amounts of pollen. They'll still rear bees, but they won't be as healthy. So you should be paying attention to the protein levels and the protein in your hives. Some of the best research, it's unfortunate, we need a lot more research, but some of the best research was done in Australia. And uh, the Australians will, I've, I've heard stories and I actually met with people that they'll be on a crop that's producing a lot of honey, a lot of nectar, but no pollen. And you can watch your hives just dwindle down because you're, you're using all your old bees and you're not reproducing them fast enough. So there are times when you'll take your, your bees off of a, a, a nectar crop and you'll bring them to, to get pollen. Pollen is so important in the hive. You really have to have uh, pollen. And not all pollens are the same. That's the other thing, and that's, I encourage you to read Somerville's book, uh, not so much for the specifics of what the plants are, but for the concept of knowing that some pollens are better than others and learning what's in your area that are nutritious. You want to be working with the nutritious pollens more than the, than the uh, ones that aren't. Uh, in his book, one thing that I, I take issue or, or I think has changed somewhat is there was a whole chapter on the economics of feeding that you could feed $5 worth of syrup to make $10 worth of honey. That used to be uh, a valid argument for, for feeding. It's no longer a valid argument in the States. Feeding 
is keeping bees alive because we need them for a specific purpose, purpose at a specific time. So the, the economics, it's more keeping bees uh, moving forward. We, uh, we would use, uh, put a lot of new frames in our hives. Uh, we were selling off hives, we were putting in new foundation, and a, a quick field indicator for good nutrition is bees making wax. Sick bees or, or un undernourished bees do not make wax, and they do not create frames of brood like this. So uh, you don't need a, a lab analysis to tell you if you have good nutrition. You should be looking to see pollen stores in your hives, but when you see brood frames like that, uh, it's telling you that your hives are well nourished, and that's what you can work with. Uh, same thing, this is a, an older frame. We call this wood to wood. You, those are well nourished bees. So, uh, if you're going to, to feed syrup or protein, one of the first things you want to understand is what is it you're trying to accomplish, what and when. What size beehive do you want and, and at what time frame? And you can just work backwards from that. In, in our case, we wanted big hives the middle of February, so our whole splitting program our, and our feeding program was keyed in to uh, whenever there was good food coming in the front door, whether it was nectar or pollen, that was fine. When there wasn't good food coming in, we could supplement accordingly to try to uh, keep that process going. We didn't want it to, uh, the queen to start and stop, start and stop. That's, that's harder on a hive. So protein, uh, we didn't feed, we only started feeding protein in, in my outfit uh, 2005, 2006, and that was kind of a turning point in U.S. beekeeping. We had a, a lot of losses around the country. Um, all of a sudden, there weren't enough bees to pollinate almonds. Uh, that's when bees from the East Coast started traveling across. It, it just changed our whole beekeeping. Before that, we had let the bees get small in the winter and, and grow naturally in the spring, and that worked for us. But when we needed to have big beehives, and the other thing, we, we lost one of our significant spring crops in Florida citrus. Florida citrus uh, developed a disease <coughs> excuse me, so called citrus greening. Uh, citrus greening is a, uh, a bacterium spread by a little bug called a psyllid. And that psyllid gets in the plant and ultimately it will, will cut back the crop and, and kill the tree. Um, consequently, there's a lot of pesticide sprays. So we lost some of our best spring forage uh, and our whole dynamic of the hive changed. But so pro protein, and it was good, really good protein, uh, really good uh, uh, pollen and nectar that we were getting there. But that changed, so we had to do something to supplement that. Um, you'll find that uh, protein is what gets, puts, puts more bees in the hive. So people always ask us, what, what do we do? This, this slide is unimportant. You can copy it if you want. Uh, everybody wants to know, what did we do? So, we didn't know anything in 05. Uh, so what do you do? You pick up the phone and you start calling your friends. And I spoke to several friends that were rearing queens and, and I asked, at that time, we didn't have a lot of commercial products to work with. There's a lot more today to, to work with and there's some really good products out there. But at the time, I asked several friends and the ones that, that I trusted and that would give me good information told me they were using brewer's yeast as a, um, as a protein source. So our first mix, was a mess. Um, it was brewer's yeast and water, and I wouldn't eat the stuff, never mind feed it to my bees. It was a cakey, it wasn't very good. So we started playing, and what I want to encourage you to think about is the process of, of what, how you, you feed bees and how you feed protein. Uh, we, we started adding honey to make it a little better consistency. We heard that bees needed uh, fat, so we, we added oil. Um, this uh, mix, uh, these are the, the dry ingredients, I'll show you the wet ingredients, developed over time. Um, it was a little bit controversial whether we should put eggs, uh, eggs or an animal protein. Uh, generally what we would do is keep playing with this mix, try it on the bees. We would ask the bees and we'd see how they responded. And when you feed protein, uh, you have hives side by side, one you feed protein and one you don't, it's really easy to tell the effect. You open uh, the hive, you look at the young brood, and, and I'll describe the, the royal jelly, or the, the, the larvae are just juicy. They're, it's a really pretty look. Uh, it glistens. It's, it's not hard to tell the difference. And any feed that you uh, choose to use, I would encourage you to do the same, same thing. Feed some hives, don't feed the others, and look at the difference. And if you can't see a difference, I'd be surprised. 
So just this is our final, a uh, lot of sugar. Uh, we have small high beetles. We wanted this product to be really attractive. We wanted the bees to eat it. So we put a lot of sugar, some protein. Uh, there is no mineral supplement that's made specifically for bees. In my case, I worked with a, a supplement that was good for cattle. One of my buddies that was doing this used a supplement for, for uh, chickens. Um, the wet ingredients, we obviously use some water. In our case, we'd use honey because we weren't making it for anybody else. We were putting it inside our hives. I, I don't know what the rules are in other places. It might be a problem in, in other areas. Uh, but we, we were just doing it inside our own hives. We'd put canola oil because I said bees need fats. Uh, lemon juice, uh, the pH of our product was important. We found that if we lowered the pH to five or a little bit lower, it was more attractive to the bees. Uh, honeybee healthy, I don't know if you have that here. That's actually a mix of essential oils. It's mostly lemongrass, it's uh, spearmint and wintergreen. It's a product that, that's fairly common now in the States. If you're, having, uh, if you're feeding syrup and, and the bees aren't taking it really well, you add this honeybee healthy, it makes things really attractive. It's very attractive to the bees. So the, the point was to make this a very attractive product. And I'll show you the, so the amount, the volume we're putting in, and the bees really loved it. Uh, we initially, this is one of my first mixers. We used a mortar mixer uh, to, to mix it, because we we're just the, the quantities that we were doing. We started out with a gasoline one, making a little bit too much noise. We got an electric one. Uh, first, we had a mixer that goes like this. We found it was better to have a mixer that goes like this. And, but this is, this is the general process, that uh, we try to make it as stiff as possible. We, liked, uh, we didn't like it soupy. And in our case, we, we had small hive beetles uh, would come out of the mixer, would go into an auger, we'd shoot it into these wax paper bags. They were roughly 12 inch by 12 inch. We'd fit about four pounds of product. And um, you see it just shooting into the bags. We'd roll it out to flatten it out, and we'd put two of those under the raised lids. All of our hives have raised lids. It's an inch and a half spacer underneath the lid. So whether it's a single or a double, we take these patties, when we're shipping bees to, to California or to Maine or to other pollinations, we can fit two of these. So it's roughly eight pounds of material. Now it's not eight pounds of protein. If, you, if I go back to the mix, I'll, you'll, you'll see there's a lot of sugar in this. And that's good too. It makes it really attractive and the bees need sugar. So this is something we found as we started, the first time we started mixing pollen, we did it, uh, a protein, we did it inside the building. And, and there must have been a day where the guys were too warm or, or were crowded and they moved all the equipment outside for a little bit. First thing we found is that the field bees, we had probably several hundred hives in our yard, the field bees would not touch this product when we were outside. It was loaded with sugar. You can see the, the volume of sugar, but the field bees didn't mess with it at all. So we started thinking, why, be, with all this sugar, why isn't there any robbing? And my theory, this is not science, but my theory is that when you mix the, the protein and the sugar together, bees have a honey stomach to carry nectar. They have spaces on their legs to carry pollen. But when you mix the two together, where do they put it? They don't. So what we found is in the hives, the, it's the nurse bees that are using this, this in, in the hive. That's why we put it inside the hive. There is open feeding of dry pollen supplement that, that people do. It has a little bit different effect. We're putting it in the hive and we're targeting the nurse bees, which is what we want because we want the best, the healthiest nurse bees to feed the next, next uh, generation uh, of bees. So we can target the, the population that, that's gonna take care of our next generation. Um, Good nutrition is important in anything, whether it's plants or animals. Uh, if anybody, uh, any kind of animal or, or plant, you know that it's good nutrition, it's going to make those, plant, those plants and animals that much more uh, able to handle um, any kind of disease that comes along. Okay, so that's protein. Now, we also fed liquid syrup whenever it was necessary. If there was a natural honey flow and you put out syrup, the bees would ignore it. Bees will will choose where they want to go. So they'll, they'll actually go to the plants, even with open feeding, uh, when, when that's available. But uh, in the States, a lot of folks were using corn syrup. We looked at corn syrup, we looked at sucrose, and we decided to go with sucrose. Uh, the, the basic sugars in sucrose are more like nectar. And 
I said earlier, you have to think about what you're trying to accomplish. If you're, trying to, to, if you're going into winter and you're trying to put weight on the bees, corn syrup will put weight on the bees much quicker because it's, it's, more, it's fructose, it's more like honey. They'll store, they tend to store that really well. Uh, if you want to stimulate the bees and get them to grow, then sucrose is a better product. There's some issues with, with uh, fructose, with uh, having HMF, high HMF, that, that can be toxic to bees if it, if it gets warm. We're in a warm, <coughs> excuse me, we're in a warm climate, that can be an issue, so there's some issues there, and there's some issues with storing sucrose. In our case, tankers were coming in, it was getting used in a hurry, we didn't have, it, have the, the storage issues. We did find that our, our um, syrup came in, went in these bulk totes. Every time we would clean these bulk totes um, with a little bit of bleach to, to keep them clean so we wouldn't have the mold. But tanker, tanker lot comes in, uh, fills up 20 to 22 of these bulk totes. We uh, typically, the syrup would come in at 67% sucrose, 67% solids. Uh, if you can see a space on the top of those totes, it was uh, about 70 or 80 gallons. We'd fill that up with water and we'd feed pretty consistently about a 50% mix. And we wouldn't vary that. Some people say a thinner syrup stimulates bees. You gotta be careful with thinner syrup because it'll ferment. So we'd pretty much consistently be 50% um, syrup. And this is the system that we used. Uh, we, the, we'd add water, we'd fill these buckets and we'd create feed stations. Now in our case, the, the goal is to build bees. So we found that open feeding uh, in our yards worked well because it followed the, it, it gave the field bees their job to do. They went out and got the groceries and brought them back home and transferred and the whole system worked really well. The, the frame of uh, new foundation that I showed you would have gotten drawn with open feeding like this. Now we wouldn't do this open feeding if there was a honey flow on, uh, we were not honey producers. That's one other disclaimer I have to, to put in here. This was not meant to put more honey in the box. This was meant to split bees and grow bees. But, but this works really well, especially with large yards. So some, sometimes we had uh, frame feeders. If we were shipping the bees across the country or they were going to be on a pollination, we would fill the frame feeders and we'd find that some moisture in that, some liquid in that, those hives um, when a, a, a beehive was traveling uh, across the country at four days on a truck, if you didn't have any liquid in there, they would, draw, they would tear out the open brood because the, the conditions would get dry. By having moisture in that hive, it would, uh, would be much more comfortable and the bees would just slowly eat that syrup inside the hive. Uh, but most of the time we were trying to grow bees, so we, we used a lot of open feeding. Um, People say when you open feed, uh, well, the strong hives are getting more and the weak hives are getting less. We dealt with that by splitting our hives. We split our hives consistently. We kept fairly even sized hives in, in yards. So uh, we'd go through and we'd, we'd make everything even. We'd split them two or three times through the fall. So we, we really didn't have big and small hives that way. But the, the goal was to grow bees. I call it riding the roller coaster. When you let your, your hives grow in the spring and then there's a dearth and there's nothing coming in, the, the dynamic of the hive, it, it, you want to keep a nice steady growth. If it, an ideal beehive would be e even or just slightly growing all the time. Of course that can't happen because you have winter. But when you, you have growth in the spring and then you have the summer dearth and then you have to come up again, it's really hard on a, on a, a, a beehive. Uh, the other thing we found that we've, we tried this a lot, uh, leaving a box of honey on the hives versus uh, feeding them. We wanted hives to grow. If you leave a box of honey on them, they sort of sit there, they don't grow the same. If you want them to grow, um, new food coming into the, the hive would, would stimulate the bees to grow as opposed to, to, to staying the way they were. Okay, so uh, I always use Bobcat loaders and uh, Bobcat skid skier loaders. And the first time I, I bought a new loader, it was a, wasn't my first loader, but when I bought a new loader, there were stickers all over the front of it that said, avoid death. And I always thought that was a wonderful expression. So far, I've done pretty good to avoid death. So, so I thought that in my beehives, I'd like to do the same thing, avoid death. That's, that's kind of the primary goal there. Um, and what we found is with a feed program, we weren't riding the roller coaster. We weren't letting our bees go down because sometimes when they drop down, they wouldn't come back up again so quickly. So we could level out some of those, those ups and downs. 
Um, people ask about CCD. That was 05, 06. Um, the term CCD is a little confusing. I don't have time to get into that. But what I can tell you is honeybee health is still a concern. We're losing 30 to 40 percent of our hives consistently in the, in the U.S. So honeybee health is, is, a, is a key problem. And um, I mentioned earlier beekeepers are problem solvers. As much as possible, we want to do the things that we can control in our hives. And giving them food when they need it and helping them to grow are, are things that, that beekeepers can control. Uh, we reared all our own queens. I'm a big believer in, in uh, selecting the best genetics. Uh, we changed out comb. as much. Our comb, on average, was less than three years old. I'm a big believer in clean comb, good genetics, clean food, any, any living organism. Those are, those are pretty uh, common sense things. That's not uh, uh, really uh, complex to understand. Some of the places we put our hives, we would put our hives to, to pollinate blueberries or cranberries where there was a fungicide, a significant amount of fungicide. Fungicide has an effect on the bees where it, it damages their, their gut bacteria so they can't process food properly. We wanted to make sure, and, and the quality of the pollen is poor also, so we wanted to make sure that, that that wasn't the only source of food that they had. So we'd put pollen patties in, and it made a world of difference when we started doing that. It really kept the hive, it, it, I mentioned the, the dynamic of a hive. In pollination, the hives start out as good as they can, and then they, it, it, without feed, they'll drop off very quickly. With feed, we can slow that process down so that they, at the end of the pollination season, we still have a critical mass of bees that we can feed healthy food again and bring them back up again. It's that roller coaster effect. And I mentioned earlier, I showed you that frame. Uh, we selected for uh, queens in our genetic stock that would produce a lot of wax. And we needed to produce a lot of wax because we were changing out, uh, we were putting in about 15,000 deep boxes a year. So, so it was important. Every time we made a split, when that hive, was, that single was ready for a second box, we'd either have four or six drawn combs and we'd have foundation on the outside. So we were always pushing our bees to draw wax. They would do that fine on a natural honey flow and they would do it fine with syrup when, when we needed that wax to get drawn. But we felt confident that when our bees were drawing wax, that was a good field indicator that they were properly nourished. Thank you very much.